Uh, our final speaker is uh, Professor, uh, Associate Professor Chris, Chris Nixon. Uh, Chris is a colleague of mine uh, at the uh, Australian Centre for Health Innovation here at the Alfred Hospital. Um, Chris uh, has been doing translational simulation in intensive care for, uh, for several years um, and uh, also um, uh, using that for education as well as process design. So Chris is going to tell us uh, again how, uh, how his processes and, and his collaborations uh, helped uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic response uh, in intensive care here at the Alfred Hospital. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, so this should chime in quite nicely, I think, with the preceding talks. Because what I'm going to do is really focus in on um, how we've used translational simulation as a strategy to um, address many of the challenges that COVID-19 has thrown up at us as an intensive care unit. And I'm going to specifically focus in on airway management or intubation in the um, intensive care unit, largely because that's a, a universal problem, I think, that um, will resonate with this audience and also pulls out many of the important aspects of translational simulation. Uh, so just a little bit of a reflection then on what our COVID-19 pandemic ICU experience has been. And I guess like everybody else, around about February, March, we, we looked aghast at what was happening in um, Wuhan, China and then subsequently seeing how the pandemic evolved in other parts of the Northern Hemisphere specifically. And what we were worried about was the impact in intensive care, the huge number of patients, how sick these patients were, and um, worryingly, um, what seemed to be um, uh, quite poor outcomes being reported in the initial waves of this pandemic. And we had, um, uh, I guess our early modeling was predicting for us that we could potentially have 10 times more critically ill patients than we had ventilators or beds to manage these patients in. Um, and I guess a little bit lost in all of that was the fact that probably more important than beds and ventilators was how do we actually maintain a safe and skilled and viable workforce to actually look after these patients in those beds. And I'm fortunate that I work in an ICU where those issues were prioritized and um, treated seriously. And so we had to look at everything we did uh, really from this perspective of a hierarchy of controls to see how we could limit um, the spread of the COVID-19 infection um, in the workplace. And so we had to look at everything we did, um, all the workflows, the clinical spaces that we were currently using and that we were projected to use if needed, um, if we needed to expand our ICU space. So that meant we addressed everything from how we screen patients and admit them to the ICU, how we move them around the hospital, um, how we intubate, extubate, perform percutaneous tracheostomies. It was, it was a systemic, uh, um, process. Um, and I guess ultimately what we experienced um, over the past few months was really been two waves of a, uh, of a pandemic. Um, and, but we've been lucky in Victoria that at no stage really is shown by this dark blue line, um, this dark blue coloration, that we never actually had more than about 50 COVID-19 pneumonitis patients in ICUs in Victoria any one stage. So we were lucky that our system was uh, not overstrained. And I think that that in large part accounts for why we've actually had good results in Victoria and in Australia and New Zealand with approximately 80% hospital survival from patients who were mechanically ventilated for coronavirus. Now, um, one of the key strategies that we've used in order to um, tackle uh, these challenges has been translational simulation. So what exactly is that? Well, many of us are familiar with simulation for education. Well, translational simulation is a term uh, coined by Victoria Brazel, uh, which really focuses in on what the function of simulation is when it's being used to improve specifically patient care and healthcare systems. And we really do this through two ways, either diagnosing safety and performance issues or delivering interventions 
uh, based around simulation to address those issues. So the focus really is on the purpose, not um, the modalities or where we actually perform the simulation, because it could be anything. And we've actually got a paper, uh, when I say we, I mean myself, Andrew Petrosoniak, who you've just heard from, Steph Barwick, uh, and also Victoria Brazel, uh, that sort of describes a unified framework for how we go from this idea or concept of translational simulation to actually putting it in practice. And this is a simplified form of it. And what it really describes is an input process output model for translational simulation where we spend a lot of effort at the beginning trying to define what the problem is. Um, and then that allows us, once we've got an idea of what we're actually trying to accomplish, as to whether translational simulation actually is the correct approach to use to address the problem, and whether the focus is going to be diagnosis or intervention. And once we have that, once we're happy with our project concept, we can actually go on to um, deliver the process, which involves designing simulations, delivering them, and implementing a predetermined strategy for data collection and, and analysis. And that can involve um, you know, you know, thematic analysis of um, uh, debriefs perform pretty much how we do it for education, but also a whole range of methodologies from the quality improvement literature and also methodologies that we've already heard about from user-centered design and um, human factors ergonomics. And then at the end of all of that, we, what we need to do is report our um, findings in an effective way, disseminate and implement them appropriately. So having talked about the challenges being faced, what translational simulation is, I now want to focus in on the issue of airway management in the intensive care unit that we faced. And so if I start really with what our key inputs were, well, we already had overseas experience to call on. We had um, guidelines, and um, this is just to highlight a, a great infographic that came from Hong Kong and Albert Chan's group that highlighted many of the particularly technical and teamwork aspects uh, that were um, uh, important for airway management. But what we needed to do was meld all that knowledge with our current local practice the way our equipment and systems were set up and our existing guidelines and checklists. And that gave us really a prototype process to test out in simulation. So we were able to design appropriate uh, simulation scenarios and deliver those in situ with authentic teams. And what I mean by authentic teams is um, frontline healthcare workers performing the actual roles that they would perform in real life in our simulations. And similar to what um, Petro has described with pluralistic walkthroughs, uh, we've used matched observers, so nurses watching nurses, doctors watching doctors in these roles, but as well specific content experts like members of our infection control team to provide additional insights. And then we basically would perform facilitated debriefs and do thematic analyses of those so that we can iteratively improve our, our process. And what we found is that after less than half a dozen uh, of these uh, simulations that we'd um, really start to achieve saturation, we wouldn't really be discovering new stuff. And that's kind of a clue that we've um, got a mature process in place. And so what were our actual outputs that we started to disseminate? Well, I've kind of tried to map them a little bit to this idea of the hierarchy of intervention effectiveness, but what we came up with was a new team structure, including outside the room roles, uh, which is probably as close as we got to a forcing function, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, we came up with a, as simplified as possible and standardized process and, and process in both equipment modified checklists and cognitive aids, revised our guideline, and then had an ongoing plan for education and training. And just so a little bit of a discussion about uh, the actual team structures that we developed. So we, we decided to go with our current ad hoc teams for intubating in the ICU, as opposed to developing an intact team, say with fixed personnel who would come and do every intubation. And the reason for that was that we um, 
thought that at least initially intubations wouldn't be that common, or at least no more common than they are usually, and that we had a structure of having intensivists in-house 24-7 anyway. We had staff who were familiar with our environments, with the equipment, with our processes, and um, our expectations for teamwork. But the team, role, team roles were different. So we minimized the number of people in the room to just three people in the room. And then we had runners and uh, PPE monitors outside of the room. Um, and in particular, this PPE monitor role, I think is a misnomer because it's so much bigger than that. Uh, they provide really that forcing function to say that, hey, there's been a PPE breach or there's a safety concern, let's stop and address it now. Uh, but they're also a coach. So they would coach people through the process of getting their PPE on, donning and doffing, and also providing updates for uh, infection control measures. Because that was one of the real challenges is that we were operating in a landscape where information was continually changing. Uh, what, what we did with our cognitive aids and checklists was use, build on what we already had, but adapt them to this new COVID world. And so one of the key things with our checklist was that it now, as you can see in orange, um, uh, components of it became part of a checklist that was performed as a pre-entry huddle where the team met before actually going into the room. And then we added um, some final checks in this purple column that would occur once we were inside the room. And it's, I think it's, there were a whole lot of technical solutions were developed and I don't want this to be a talk about airway management, but there were other technical solutions that came up. Things like how do we actually safely dispose of equipment without spraying things all, all around the room? And in particular, how do we attach the ventilator without blasting high flow oxygen um, uh, that may uh, increase contamination around the room as well. So that involved, for instance, a process of presetting the ventilator, turning it off, and then only turning it on again once we had a, a circuit connected. And I was lucky after all of this process to be involved in the Safe Airway Society guidelines, which uh, crystallized a lot of the concepts that came out of this and developed um, uh, more infographics, cognitive aids and checklists that could be used by other centres um, uh, and modified to fit their contexts. And a key thing that came out of the Safe Airway Society guideline were these principles that anything we do needs to be safe for patients and staff. It needs to be simple so that it can be efficiently implemented, ideally should be familiar to staff and reliable so that it doesn't matter who's uh, which people are doing it, it's still going to work and ultimately robust so that it will work regardless of the patients or environments that it's being used in. And that brings me finally to the aerosol box for intubation, which is uh, something that the FDA um, uh, provided an emergency use authorization, I think in May um, of 2020. And, you know, this has some face vis uh, validity. It's essentially a perspex box, which um, seeks to contain aerosolized particles, thus hopefully um, preventing exposure to the clinicians who are providing airway management. And I know that uh, Petro's group in Toronto and Albert Chan's group in Hong Kong uh, did usability testing and simulation and um, early on in the piece had identified concerns with this device. Uh, I was lucky to be part of a, a, a group uh, led by Jonathan Begley um, out at Cabrini Health that uh, performed a crossover study using experienced anaesthetists actually performing to the letter the Safe Airway Society guidelines for intubation. And what they showed was that there were statistically and cl clinically significant delays in getting the, the, the tube in, which could result in significant hypoxia to patients. And also that there were safety risks to staff, particularly through PPE breaches as shown in these images, with the, um, the risk being expo exposed here on the left and even tears occur occurring in the gowns. And subsequently, another group in Melbourne, uh, first author, Joe Simpson, um, out of Box Hill, 
they did another simulation study where they simulated continuous production of aerosolized particles and also coughing within the perspex box and paradoxically found that when they measured airborne particles that the original form of this box would actually lead to increased air particles, uh, aerosolized particles in the room where the intubation was occurring. And so um, ultimately the FDA withdrew their um, emergency use authorization. And as Laura Duggan has said in um, uh, uh, one of her writings that it goes to show that something isn't always better than nothing and really emphasizes that while we always have a drive towards using technology and devices that look like they make sense, um, that this uh, gizmo idolatry can sometimes lead us astray. And so I'd finally like to conclude that having discussed airway management in the ICU as an example, that uh, I really believe that translational simulation is a useful strategy for addressing health systems challenges, particularly during a pandemic. And one of the other things that it highlights to me is that human factors expertise is, is, is a rare and precious commodity and that there's really a, um, uh, an onus on all of us who work in healthcare to develop increasing awareness of human factors ergonomics so that when we do need to make a difference for our patients, uh, we can crack on and do so. Thank you very much.